presenting is uh, Eric Florenzano. Eric is a developer from San Francisco. He co-hosted the Django Dose podcast and has open sourced several Django apps, but now spends time working at his company, Clutch.io, where he believes A-B testing and rapid iteration are the keys to an app's success. Please welcome Eric. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so here today, I'm going to talk about sort of what I think Django's role is on mobile, both today, like what, what you can do today, and then what I think some of the ways that it could be useful going forward into the future. So uh, first of all, who am I? Why would I feel like I could talk about any of this stuff? Uh, well, I used to do more Django stuff. I haven't been doing so much lately. Uh, but I open sourced some apps, Django pagination, Django avatars, I think was another one I, uh, that I open sourced. but. Um, haven't been doing as much lately because I've been co-founding a company, uh, Clutch.io, uh, where basically we were building uh, mobile apps. So I was this Django guy who basically went completely the other direction and, and dove into mobile, really with no idea what I was doing. Um, and so I learned a lot along the way. And long story short, we built a couple apps, ended up building tools, and actually we ended up, uh, the Twitter ended up acquiring our IP uh, a couple weeks ago. So I'm at Twitter now. <laughs> Uh, so back to what is Django's role on mobile? Well, first of all, I think it's important to talk about what do I mean when I say mobile? Because mobile is this huge nebulous concept. Um, it can mean lots of different things. And I think um, these, these are some of the things that I'm going to talk about. I think um, when I sort of dove into the whole idea of, of mobile and, and starting to build mobile apps, I sort of focused on what do I think is, have the most uh, uh, opportunity for developers right now. And so I kind of took a survey and looked at all what was available. And you know, BlackBerry, huge market. There's tons of stuff out there, but maybe not quite so interesting for me personally as I was, as I was diving in. Things like feature phones, there's tons of, tons of feature phones out there, especially in some of the third world countries, but maybe not quite so interesting for me as a developer. So I focused on things like iOS and Android, which seem to be the things that have the most momentum right now and the things that have the most opportunity for developers. So that's. That's sort of more of what I'm going to talk about here. Um, and necessarily, when you start talking about iOS and Android, you start to think a lot more about native code. Um, we kind of live in the world of Django, where we kind of can write Python code. It's all interpreted. It's super dynamic. Uh, we can push updates all the time. But when you start diving into iOS and Android, you have to sort of backtrack a little bit and think a lot more native and a lot more static. Um, but it's important to remember that it's not all about these applications that get distributed. There's also the mobile web. And the mobile web is a very difficult thing to kind of define, because who's to say what's mobile web and who's to say what's normal web? But I think that like, it's, it's, it's definitely the case that there are some things that are optimized for viewing on mobile devices. And so that's another thing that you can, you can really focus on um, when you're thinking about mobile as compared to just normal uh, web things. And I think it's also important to think about the concept of the app store. I mean, this is one of the big reasons why people are jumping towards um, developing for mobile. Because right now, the app store, uh, both on Android and on iOS, can provide an insane amount of distribution for your app. If you get to the top of the, of the list of the rankings in one of the app stores, for, even just for a category of apps, you can get millions of downloads per day. It's, it's incredible. So there's this massive opportunity. Um, that's out there, and I kind of want to talk about how we can think about that. So first of all, what's similar between building an app with Django for the web and building an app for iOS or for Android and distributing it um, to an app store? Well, first of all, there's, I mean, some of these are, pr these are pretty generic, right? Like controller logic, yes, that is similar. Um, the idea that you have something that queries some data, you know, arranges it in some way, massages the data, makes it useful to the user, and then you know, outputs it to the, to the user in a format that they can consume. That's something that is similar across both building with Django and building uh, applications. Uh, oftentimes, both of these things are data-driven. You have, like I say, you, uh, the first thing I said is you query some data. That's, that's pretty much the first step of any of these things. The, the ORM wouldn't be really useful unless we were driving our, our apps with data. And that's something that's seems to be the case across most applications as well. Um, and then all of these platforms have some idea of separating logic from presentation. Um, so that's another, re that's another uh, thing that sort of it's a common theme across both platforms. 
but there are definitely more differences than there are similarities in my mind when it comes to comparing uh, Django web development versus mobile app development. And the first of which is kind of the, the, the elephant in the room is that um, basically you have to build your mobile applications in a way that's asynchronous. Um, so yeah, it's possible to run Django in an asynchronous way, especially if you monkey patch and you use uh, Gevent. But by and large, Django is generally considered to be a synchronous framework. Um, and that means that when you do a database call, you get a result and then you do something with it and then you make another database call. Maybe you call out to grab a, a web page or whatever. But you have to do things in a synchronous way. Um, but whereas with applications, whether it's iOS or Android, the main thread for the application is what's, in, wh is what's responsible for basically moving things around on the screen. So if you do a blocking operation from the main thread of your Android or iOS application, it's going to stop. And you're gonna, you're, your user's going to get mad, they're going to hit, they're going to try and like scroll, and it's not going to work. And then all of a sudden, once the blocking operation finishes, it's going to all catch up and do all the things that you did in the meantime. If you've ever experienced that, that's probably what happened. Um, so basically, you can never do that. You always have to do things on separate threads and marshal them back, or you have to do things in other ways. Um, so the other thing is HTTP, which is obviously what we're all using when we, when we uh, interact with Django, uh, it's stateless. And so basically, you have to do a lot of things. A lot of, a lot of what comes from HTTP kind of makes its way into Django, the web framework, as well. So anytime someone makes a request, you have to re-query for all the things and, and re-verify that things are correct. So you, know, you might be inside of a dashboard inside of your application. You've authenticated the user, and they're clicking around the dashboard. Um, the second page that they hit, you have to re-authenticate that user. You have to query, you have to get the, back their session, verify that it's still that same user, query maybe some of the, some of the uh, stuff to create the sidebar and re-output a lot of that data. This is, if you just came from Adrian's keynote, you can hear a lot of similarities when I'm talking about with what he was talking about with the PJAX stuff. Uh, whereas in an application, you're, it's, the whole thing is in memory and the whole thing has a bunch of state. You don't have to re-query anything. If the user's logged in, you don't have to verify that they're logged in when they click a button. They're still logged in and they just click the button. So you can kind of change the way you think about things a little bit when you start thinking about applications versus websites. Uh, another thing is that there's a, a massively longer development cycle. Um, even if you disregard the fact that Apple will be a gatekeeper and sometimes will take weeks to months to approve your app, even if they approved your app instantly, like more like what Google does, uh, you still have the to go through the cycle of actually pushing that out, getting that all, all out to all the different app stores across the world. Sometimes it takes a while for that to propagate. And then the user actually has to go in and take an action and download the new version of your app. And even if they have automatic syncing on with Android, you, it still takes that a while to pull and, and re-download the new, the new stuff. So even if everything went perfectly smoothly, which it never does, it still takes a while to get an update of code from your local development machi machine out into the uh, onto the phones of your customers. Um, obviously, we all think about memory constraints when we build our queries and when we're doing things in memory on the server. Um, and even if you're doing a lot of JavaScript things, you think about the memory constraints and you think about what kinds of things are, are good here and what kind of things shouldn't I do here. But it's more pronounced on mobile. You really have to think about it. You'll do something and then realize that the reason why it's crashing is because it's like using all the memory and, and can't do that. Um, so it's got to be a constant thought in the back of your mind when you're working on mobile. Um, another thing is that, and, and there are exceptions to all these things. Like, yes, you have to worry about memory constraints. Connectivity isn't always guaranteed on the web. You can do offline tasks. But um, the next thing is that, yeah, when, you make a web, when your user makes a request to your website, they are necessarily connected to the internet. You're, you're communicating to them over the internet. Whereas if you build an application and you install it on the user's phone, you don't know when they're going to actually when they're going to turn it on, or uh, you know what their internet connection is going to be like. Maybe it's on an iPod Touch and they only have Wi-Fi access, and they're at their parents' house, which has a different Wi-Fi key. You have no idea what's going to happen. Um, so you have to be able to build your app in in a scenario with, that can deal with no having no access. And finally, uh, you have a lot less real estate when you're working with mobile. So um, you have to really think about what is, the th what is the main thing that I want the user to see right now, and then get rid of all the extra stuff, and, or make it like sort of on another page or something like that. So I want to dive into a little bit into like iOS, 
what is like what when if I want to build an app and distribute it using iOS, what do I have to know? Well, uh, you have to build your app in, in Objective C, which is actually a superset of C. Um, so all of your C code that you've ever written before will work, uh, but there's it gives you a lot of nice uh, extras that make things a lot easier um, to understand and to read and to write. Um, if Django is the is a web framework for building app, web applications. Coco is probably the closest thing that you can get um, on the iOS side, and it's actually provided by Apple. Um, the difference between Coco and something like Django is that Coco is much, much lower level. Coco, for example, constructs the things that are equivalent to CSS and the equivalent to HTML um, from nothing. So it, it kind of gets us to the, where the web is rather than what Django provides on top of that. Um, and then finally, if you're going to build an iOS app, you need to know uh, you need to use Xcode. That's just kind of the, the way that things work right now. Um, and I'll talk about some exceptions to that later on. But basically, Xcode is, is kind of the only game in town. So let's dive in a little bit more into Coco. And kind of, I want to make some comparisons from Coco to what you would expect in Django. Um, so in Django, if you want to query some data and you want to display it to the user, you're probably going to write that in a view, um, most likely. Uh, and in Coco, the equivalent to that is a view controller. That's just what they call it. But basically, a view controller is responsible for querying data, query, like get, uh, uh, getting uh, all of the presentation logic, putting the data into the presentation logic, and showing it to the user, um, and then handling like events that happen. Uh, a view is actually the thing that ends up being displayed to the user. So it's it's a piece. It's something that knows how to render itself. And so the view is actually. Uh, the, the view controller is actually instantiating view objects and putting them into the screen. Uh, and then a nib and zib are these basically a definition file f using XML that uh, describes how, a, how some stuff should be shown to the user. So you actually use nibs and zibs to control how views look. Um, and then finally, there's this concept. It's kind of an elegant concept, I think, um, of a delegate object. And um, you know what? I'm probably not going to go into describing delegates, but there's this, co this concept of a delegate, which basically lets one object delegate all of its logic to another object. And it's kind of cool. Um, so OK, that's iOS. What about Android? Android has basically the exact same thing. So Android, instead of writing in Objective-C or instead of writing in Python, you're going to write in Java. But it doesn't get compiled down to class files and, and to JVM bytecode. It gets compiled down to Dalvik bytecode, which is interpreted by um, Google's own Dalvik interpreter. Um, and the equivalent of a view or of a view controller in Android is this thing called an activity. And it does exactly the same thing. Um, the only thing that's a little bit different than on Android than on iOS is that there's this kind of cool idea of this thing called an intent, which you can kind of think about. Like I'm going to simplify massively here, as I've been doing for uh, some of these iOS concepts too. But an intent is basically a hyperlink, uh, a native hyperlink that you can add like a bag of data to. So you, let's say you want to pop open a web view, you would create like a, a web view intent. You'd attach the URL that you want to open. You'd attach any other things. Maybe you've got like a user you want to have logged in. I don't know if the web view can do that. And then you would pass that intent off to the, to the Android system. And Android would actually launch that web view and uh, navigate to the proper URL. The cool thing about intents is that you can put a bag of data on it when you, when you create it. And then you can, put a, you can get a bag of data off of it when it returns. So a lot of times, you'll pop open a, a, a prompt to the user. The user will type something in and hit OK, and the intent will actually be able to give you data back if you structure it properly. Uh, views work exactly the same way. Views are actually responsible for rendering themselves. Um, and then, yeah, there's a similar thing. In, similar to the CSS or similar to the nib or zip file that I was talking about with iOS, they have a layout XML uh, file as well, which is, yes, it's XML. Most people edit it manually. There's not really any. There, there are some things that try and be like interface builder or try and be visual about it, but most of the time it's just people edit that manually. So, okay, going back to Django, what does Django do today? What can you do with Django right now? Well, the, 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 the most common thing that people do today with Django and its role on mobile is to serve up API, APIs to power API driven apps. So you can think of things like Instagram, uh, which does a lot of this. Uh, and basically, the way that this works is 
you choose some server-side framework uh, for creating APIs, something like TastyPy, uh, something like Django REST framework, or I think Piston is still around. Um, and then you, on the other side, in your application, you query this over HTTP. So you might use something like AF networking if you're on iOS, or you might use something like Android async HTTP if you're on Android. Um, and just as kind of an aside, so I've been doing this for a little bit now, and something that I found empirically interesting was that making a, a web request is, is an HTTP request from Android or from iPhone is actually pretty expensive. You have to, most of the time you have to marshal it off to a different thread. You have to basically get all the data. It's got to open a connection. It's going to download all the data, and then it's got to marshal that through back to the original uh, caller. And actually, if you spawn like five or six of these requests at a time, um, the context switching and everything that's going on can get really expensive. So sort of anecdotally, what I've found is that it's much better to make one bigger, fatter request than to make like a bunch of requests to uh, individual endpoints. Um, and kind of going back to some of the memory things, it's also important that you don't include too much more data than you need uh, because A, the, connect the connection is usually pretty bad. Um, and then B, also it takes actually, like the, the time to parse the response in JSON and then marshal it, unmarshal it, and get it into objects that you can work with is actually non-trivial. So the more, the bigger the, the request is, um, and the more requests you make, it's definitely, it definitely slows things down. So that's, these are the kinds of things that you actually have to think about uh, when you're doing mobile stuff. Um, but there's some kind of interesting problems that, that come into play. And I haven't seen any, actually some of them are, are legitimately unsolved problems. And, like we're waiting for Apple to come up with a solution. Uh, but some of them are, are not. So basically, there's two ways you can do uh, prop, like basically proper authentication um, in API-driven web applications. The first one is uh, just using HTTP basic. But you have to use HTTP basic with uh, SSL. Otherwise, it's completely insecure. Um, but the other way is OAuth. And OAuth is kind of the way that most things have started to go these days. And thanks to things like TastyPy and some of these other frameworks that have, have come out uh, recently, it, it makes OAuth a lot easier to do. Um, but there is a problem. And the problem is that basically to do OAuth properly, you have to sign your request. And to sign your request, you need to have a secret key. And if you want to put, if you want to have a secret key, you need to embed it into the application. And if you embed it into the application, there's basically no way that you can stop someone from decompiling your application and figuring out your secret key. So you can obfuscate it, but there's really no way to um, completely hide it from anyone who's going to try and find it. So that's kind of an unsolved problem, and we're going to need to wait for, basically, for hardware support or from some support from the operating system. Um, but I thought that was kind of interesting to point out that there are still things on mobile that are kind of obvious but are still unsolved. It's kind of the Wild West a little bit. Um, and then there's also the sign-up problem, which is if you want to make an authenticated request but the user's not signed up yet, th there are some difficulties there as well because you, you don't have a, a secret key or you don't have a uh, client token. Okay, so let's say that today you want to build uh, an application and you have no time to learn all of this stuff that I've been talking about. You want to just build it using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Well, thankfully today there are some really cool tools that allow you to do that. Um, the first tool is something called PhoneGap. And actually it's been renamed. It, it's, but PhoneGap is the thing that you're going to get the most Google hits for. So I'll just keep it as that. Um, but basically this lets you wrap um, your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in a native package. And this gets you a ton, of different, a ton of advantages. First of all, it actually exposes lots of native functionality through JavaScript interfaces. So things like apps, being able to uh, vibrate the phone, or access the camera, or do things with push notifications. These are things that you can actually do using JavaScript, using some language that you already know. Um, but that's really not the most important part. The most important part is that you can wrap it into an application package and submit it to the App Store. So when I first started talking about things, I was mentioning about how um, awesome a distribution channel the App Store can be. And if you hit the top of the charts, you can get so, so many downloads. Well, this is a way that you can take your web app and actually get the advantages of the App Store distribution um, sort of channel. Um, and then another thing is that it actually, when you go, when you sell an app through the App Store, or even if it's not selling it, if, if, even if you're giving it away for free, when you, once the user has downloaded that, it goes under their home screen. And the importance of that can't really be understated. Even if you've got Safari, or even if you've got you know, Android's Chrome, 
if, you, if you're a bookmark in one of those browsers, you're going to have a whole lot less visibility than if you, get, if you can be installed on that home screen. So that's a huge advantage of being able to wrap it. And the good news about this is that you can use Django for this. You can literally point, you can have this whole wrapper and have it point at some website on the internet that you're powering with Django. So that's really awesome, right? Except you probably shouldn't do it because it's, it's really going to make a bad app. <laughs> uh, so, so it's basically, the idea is that it's kind of not a good practice to, to have the application running on the server. Most of the time what you try and do, uh, the best practice for PhoneGap apps is to push as much logic as possible into the JavaScript part of it and to push as much of that JavaScript onto the, uh, onto the phone itself as, as cached files. Um, in fact, the best practice is to actually take all of your HTML, all of your CSS, all of your JavaScript, any images that are being used by the CSS, and all of that stuff, and actually packaging it up into the application wrapper so that when the user downloads it from the App Store, they get all of the, all of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, that's the way that you get the best performance. That's the way that you get the most responsiveness on your applications. Um, unfortunately, that means you can't really use much Django there. Um, and, but what you can do is you can do all of that, and then you can have that talk to a web service to, to populate its, its data. And that web service can be, again, speaking Django. But at that point, you've switched out uh, sort of the native stuff with, uh, with just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And the other problem with that is that performance, even if you do all of these best practices, performance can be really, really tough uh, to get right. So you can get it there, but it's a lot harder. So, I kind of want to talk about some things. So that's, that's the current state. The current state is really this state of APIs are kind of where Django can fit in. And then you can also use PhoneGap to wrap your app and point at a Django instance. Um, but it's really kind of not going to work out very well if you do that. So where, what's Django's role in the future? Where can we go? What, what sort of things can we do that can make it more relevant or can make us sort of more um, useful here? Well, there's some really cool things that are happening in the Ruby world right now uh, as it relates to specifically to iOS, less about Android, but more towards iOS. Uh, there's this new project called Ruby Motion. And what that does is it actually lets you write iOS applications using Ruby. Uh, and that doesn't sound all that interesting, except for the fact that there's now there's tons of Ruby people who have access to create these applications that they never would have, have done before. They don't have to learn Objective-C. They don't have to learn any of that stuff. And the way that Ruby Motion does it is that it actually gives you basically very direct access to those Cocoa constructs that I was talking about earlier. So instead of creating an app, um, uh, a view controller in uh, Objective-C, you write your view controller in Ruby. You still basically use the Cocoa framework, but you, you, but you write your views using Ruby. So, all, all the people who understand and are really familiar with Rails, are really familiar with all of the Rails things, that doesn't really get them as far as people who understand sort of the Cocoa frameworks. But it's a really exciting start, and I think that we're going to see a lot of cool stuff coming from that. And I kind of want to point out that one of the more interesting things about this development isn't that you can use Ruby to write iOS applications. It's that you can kind of do an end run around Xcode. Because Xcode is just the fact that you have to buy into Xcode, you, it, you can't really plug too, much, too many things into it. It's kind of, Xcode is kind of the representation of like Apple's way of doing things. And so by being able to write things in Ruby, by being able to use your standard like Rake, you know, these, these tools that are, that are um, and there's a motion tool that they give you, you can just run, run it right from the command line. A lot of people want, want to use separate editors that maybe they want to use Sublime or, or text made or anything like that. Um, those are now all of a sudden possible with something like Ruby Motion. So it's more of like a, almost like a, like a societal thing or like a, like a mental thing that's more interesting about this rather than a technical thing, even though the technical aspects of it are very interesting. Um, so, okay, that's Ruby. That's great for Ruby guys. But what about uh, Python? What, what can we do? What's the future of, of Python and Django specifically? when it comes to mobile applications? Well, it turns out that it's actually possible to cross-compile Python for iOS, which is like insanely cool to me. Uh, and there's a bunch of projects. There's a couple of different uh, GitHub repos of people who are doing this. Um, unfortunately, they're all kind of in this weird state of not quite working, but definitely like they've proved that it's possible. So I don't really want to 
uh, endorse one specific one because there's a couple of them that are out there. Um, but it's possible. And with the advent of this possibility, we can do some really cool things. Um, and and for, on the Android side, there's something called Pi4a, which originally was something that lets you wrote, write Python applications, and then you had to have a separate Python interpreter installed. But now Pi4a can actually bundle the interpreter in with the application, so you can distribute one binary file through the App Store, and, um, which is basically really cool. Uh, but unfortunately, these are still really immature. We need to, to spend a lot of time making them uh, more robust, making sure that they're bulletproof, making sure that they work on all different kinds of versions of these operating systems, and that they're really easy to install. Specifically, the, the, uh, the iOS stuff is still very, very alpha. Um, so what can we do with this? I, I started thinking about how cool it would be to, to, to embed a Python interpreter inside my application. And, and the first thing I thought of is a mobile Django. And that's pretty cool, right? But it's also kind of boring. It's, it's basically the idea here is that you embed this interpreter, you actually run Django on your phone, and you go back to what I was talking about earlier with the PhoneGap style approach where you can embed web pages inside your app that look like an application. Um, but instead of just using plain HTML and JavaScript, you could actually use the ORM. By the way, all of these platforms have SQLite, so you, you could actually use the ORM to do queries against SQLite on the local phone database and do all kinds of really cool things there, um, as well as getting access to the wealth of Python libraries that are available for things like date formatting and doing all kinds of really cool, and internationalization, all those cool things. Um, and then you would distribute that PhoneGap app through the, through the App Store. So legitimately, you could just package a Django app up as a native application. And that's cool. Uh, but it's also a little boring in the sense that it's really not pushing any sort of limits. And it actually would probably be kind of slow. We would have to see how that would look. But what I think is the more interesting thing is what a really sort of a cool mobile Django could look like, which you could take the, cool, the good parts of Django, the things that don't really have to do necessarily with an HTTP request and an HTTP response, things like the ORM, things like internationalization, things like templates or... You know, there's a, there's a bunch of things that Django has that are really useful for any application. And then you take that base and you build on top of that some abstractions that speak to the native library. So, in, so actually driving view controllers, actually creating views and instantiating them, and actually moving the, the, those things around the screen um, in a sort of an almost a more native way. Um, and if you put those together, you get something that's a lot more interesting as far as like a mobile Django is concerned. And I think this is what we're going to see. Um, maybe it's not going to come out this year, but maybe it'll be next year. But I think we're definitely going to see something like this in the, few, in the next coming years. Um, and it's going to be very cool. So I'll just kind of wrap up and, and try and recover everything that I've, that I've said here. Basically, Django development is very different from mobile app development. And I think it's important to recognize how different they are and not try and take some of our ideologies and just place them over in the, in the, in the native app world without thinking about it. Um, but right now, you can use Django. It's super useful as a API layer, as a, as a sort of a data backend for, for these applications. Um, and you can do things today, like wrapping web applications inside of a native container. Uh, but you're going to have difficulties both in you know, making them look proper and then also making them respond properly uh, and make them feel really, really nice. But in the end, I think that what we're going to see in the future is a combination of these Python interpreters being embedded uh, as well as some new frameworks that people need to basically still create. And I think that, that that's what we're going to see in the coming years. And maybe one of you guys here uh, are going to be the per person to build it. So. That's basically all I had. Unfortunately, I'm, I went really fast today. So uh, there's a lot of time for questions. Uh, so you can either uh, tweet me. I'm Eric Flo on Twitter. Um, and I'm checking that all the time now that I work at Twitter. And uh, <laughs> uh, you can email me or come talk to me in the hallway. Or there's a ton of time now for questions. So uh, if you have any, please walk up to the mic and l let's ask them. Um, as it stands now, um, do you recommend using Django as 
running the API backend or what you know of other solutions such as Flask, would, would that be a better solution? Or like, it, it seems like it's kind of heavyweight for that purpose, right? Yeah, it, it really depends. I mean, this, is, this comes down to totally like personal preference. Back to, would you use Flask for a normal application that you would write versus would you use Django for a normal application? Um, I think there are a lot of benefits for going with something that you're familiar with and something that's obviously well documented and with, thing, with API frameworks like TastyPy out there, um, it can make it super easy to build an API. Um, and then there's also the other thing which is that if you're just gonna, like, the, your requirements are likely to change. So I've built, I mean, I've built an app with Flask and I was, it was really simple, it was really nice, and then all of a sudden the requirements changed and I needed a little bit more features, I needed a little bit more functionality, and all of a sudden I turned this little app that I thought was gonna be this tiny little API layer turned into something a little bit bigger. Um, and I found myself missing a lot of what Django provided. So I think that's also important to kind of keep in mind is that um, you know, if you want to if you want to expand these things, a lot of times Django can have things that are really really nice. Now, that's not a that's not a dig against Flask. That's not a dig against any of these these other things. Um, it's simply my my own familiarity would have made that a lot faster. Hey, Eric, uh, a question I have for you is: I hear you know things about UI WebView. Uh, <laughs> can you talk a little bit about how? Um, UI WebView in Cocoa can be used with Django in mobile applications and whether it's a good practice or not? Yeah. Um, so if, if for any of you guys who aren't familiar, my company basically, well, the first product that we built was a, a UI WebView that was highly customized in, in, in order to increase performance um, so you could build some local apps a lot faster. Um, so the, basically the big problem with the UI WebView as opposed to um, Safari browser on the on the, I, on the iPhone and, and iOS is that it doesn't just in time compile the JavaScript. That's like the main thing. Well, there's, there's kind of two things. One of them is easy to fix, the other one is hard. So the easy thing to fix is that the, the scrolling uh, sort of elasticity is different uh, by default on, I, on UI WebView than it is for every other component of iOS. Um, and in the old days, you actually had to sort of scrape through all the sub views and get access to the scroll view and then change its elasticity. Fortunately with iOS 5, uh, Apple has made the scroll, the, the underlying scroll view underneath the UI web view accessible. So you can actually just change the constant on there and make it, and make it just as glossy as everything else. Um, so that's like just a very implementation specific detail there. Um, but as far as Django is concerned, I kind of stick by what I said earlier, which is that if you're, this is kind of the, the mistake that Facebook made, is instead of having their, app, their logic all in, in JavaScript on the client, they did a lot of their logic on the server, and it required lots of round trips. So whenever you'd click a button, it would have to round trip to the server, come back, and before it would actually change its, its state a lot of times. Um, that's a recipe for having a really high latency, really low, um, sort of usable uh, application. So I think that the problem with using Django right now for these applications is that you have to run it on the server until some of these client-side um, interpreters are, are more fleshed out. And if you have to run it on the server, then you necessarily need these round trips, and that leads to the really bad slowness. So that's, that's sort of my take on, on that. Um, I hope that answers your question. It does. Thanks. Okay. Eric, uh, first of all, congratulations on being acquired <laughs> by Twitter. It's a big deal. Thank you. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, your dream, I guess I could say, about mobile Django and how to move forward. Um, I've worked a little bit with Sencha and I've looked at PhoneGap, and the thing that really turned me off was scrolling is so slow because yeah. it's going to WebKit, going to Safari. It's not the same experience as what we're used to in native apps. Do you see any way that we can have a framework where, for example, on Android, we have something running off of the Dalvik VM and you're able to leverage something natively when it comes to UI interaction. Is that something that's possible, you think? Is it something that, you know, is it gonna be like an Adobe Flash that you download once and then other apps can use it? Where does that work for us? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. I think that, so when you, when you start thinking about things like Sencha and you start thinking about those, these kinds of things, they have to be inside of the web browser. And the web browser, it's really great at doing a, some rendering things, but as far as having like a really responsive, 
really rich and you know, nicely scrolling application, there, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and yes, I think we're going to see strides in that in the coming sort of years, but I think it's in the coming years rather than the coming months. Um, so the, the cool thing here is that we have an opportunity to actually bypass that and get rid of, the, a web view has so much stuff in it that you might not care about. Um, there's, it, there's just tons of things. There's all kinds of parsing. There's all kinds of display things. There's crazy CSS3 things. There's whole engines that are loaded in that you might not care about. Whereas if you get access to the Python interpreter, you could actually drive native things. You could only load up the things that you really want. You can only load up, load up the things you need. In fact, one of the things, just to give you an example of on, and I'm sure you, you probably know this, but maybe everyone else doesn't. But when you actually tap on a UI web view in iOS, it, it inserts, like I think, a 400 millisecond delay to wait for you to see if you're going to tap again. And so it will register it as a double tap. Whereas 99% of applications out there don't ever do a double tap action. Like when you tap on a thing in a list view, you want it to go immediately to the thing in the list. So these are the kinds of things that by default, the defaults for web browsers might make sense, but for an application just might not. And if we uh, code things specifically to drive those native interactions, and, and even if it's interpreted, even if it's embedded in, in a Python interpreter that's, that's going to be a lot slower than native, I still think we can get fat much, much, much faster than, for example, a um, web view could. And in, also, there's one more thing to add here, is that a lot of times with this, when you're doing things that, that require scrolling, um, you can construct it all and kind of give it to the operating system and then let the operating system deal with the actual scrolling so that it renders a buffer off screen and when you scroll down it can handle the individual frames updating rather than having to have it query, you know, go in, back into the interpreter every time, come back out um, and do all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for working with the native rendering um, and being able to get a lot faster optimizations there. I hope does that answer? Uh, just a quick follow-up. Yep. Uh, something just popped in my mind when you talked about kind of offloading things to the OS. Um, is there a way we can leverage things that we're going to miss going with the phone gap solution, like maybe orientation awareness or pin zooming or those sorts of things that we kind of miss because we're not using those native UI elements? Yeah, no, so that's what I, it goes kind of back to what I think that we should use native UI elements. I just think that Python should drive the sort of positioning and display and rendering of those native. Like, at the end of the day, it should be native rendering. Uh, in my opinion, it's just that uh, what's drive, what is going to drive that native rendering? What's going to sort of be the puppet master behind the native rendering? Um, so I think at the end of the day, it should be, you know, these native UI views on top of an OpenGL context, not rendered by, you know, um, UI web view, but actually rendered by the operating system through its, its normal contexts. Thank you. No more questions. Sorry, I, I, I ended way early today. I just rushed through it. <laughs> All right, Eric, thank you very much.